Good afternoon, Madam Clerk. You're all set. Yes, Mr. Chair, all set. Great. Thank you. I think we're going to go ahead and get started. We want to convene today's G Committee meeting, Monday, March 29, 2021. Um, I have number two remarks by the chair. Senator Flex, any comments? Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm uh, glad we're having this meeting today and I look forward to the conversation ahead. I just wanted to say just two clarifying things, both for members and for the public watching at home. I know many of our members are on different committees and they're meeting simultaneously. So if you see folks uh, bouncing back and forth, um, that's why we're trying to, to juggle um, being on multiple uh, committees at the same time. And I would also just add that if you, um, if from time to time we are a little bit slow when we get into the debate on these bills, reading the actual language, um, that is also because we have to switch from our Zoom screens to the actual documents to be able to see them. So it may be a little tedious at times, the, the conversation today. And I just wanted everyone to have an understanding of, of what we're trying to, to juggle here. And um, I'm, I'm looking forward to a good meeting. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Chair Flexer. Senator Sampson, Representative Mr. Press, any comments? Senator Thank Sampson. you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I uh, appreciate the recognition. Uh, I will first off I will welcome the uh, the members of the committee and uh, uh, the uh, nonpartisan staff that's always with us. Uh, thank you for all the good hard work that you do, um, and also members of the public that uh, are watching and uh, looking forward to a um, a lively meeting today. Um, just with respect to uh, the uh, the Senate Chairman's uh, comments, I, I want to uh, echo them. Um, there's uh, several significant committee meetings going on today with some uh, you know relatively controversial items. So people are, are certainly uh, apt to be uh, trying to cover multiple locations, including myself. Um, but I'm going to try and devote most of my time to this committee today. Um, but if you do see people uh, step out or they're, they're not uh, visible for whatever reason, uh, please understand it's, it's because we do have uh, sometimes uh, more than one responsibility. And uh, the, the second part of uh, her comments was about the uh, reading the bills. And I'll ju just make a, a very polite um a complaint to the chairs that uh, we did receive a lot of the language for these bills uh, just before this meeting. Um, we understand that sometimes there are last minute changes and you've been very good with us about talking about what they are, but just for future reference, uh, it would be very helpful because some of the bills are, are pretty long and uh, to get language uh, just a few minutes before the meeting can, can make it difficult, but we uh, intend to be as cooperative as we can today and uh, just looking for uh, some help going forward in that regard. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and Madam Chairman also. Thank you, Senator. Further Mr. Francesco, any comments? Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and Madam Chair. It's uh, nice to see you again. Um, I just uh, welcome everyone. Looking forward to a, a good conversation today. We have a lot of bills on the agenda. And just to really kind of echo Senator Sampson's remarks, I, I, you know, the staff here has been absolutely wonderful. And I, and I realize we are in difficult times working with Zoom and I, and I get that last minute changes do occur. So I would just ask uh, the committee, if you can just be a little more sensitive to us so we can get these bills more in a timely fashion, any, any language changes. It certainly would be helpful to us and certainly speed up the process. So I appreciate all the work everyone is doing, but I just wanted to just address that at this time. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Looking forward to a, a good meeting today. Thanks. Thank you, Representative. And I, I will say in, in response that I totally appreciate it. it's a valid concern and, 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 and comment. I did, uh, I've been trying to, had, tried to be as forthcoming with the, the language as possible. I forwarded to, to you last evening when I received it, forwarded the change to you this morning when I received it. So I know the, the formal documents may not have been in your inbox a short time ago. You had every, everything we had, you received when we received it. So but we keep, definitely keep that in mind and we'll, we'll work on that for as we move forward. So thank, thank you for those comments. Okay, with that, uh, we'll move on to section three, bills resolution for final action. Item one, house joint number 50. Uh, Resolution commemorating the 22nd anniversary of the Connecticut Taiwan sister state relationship. Uh, is there a motion to? Is there a motion? Yes, Senator Flexer makes a motion to JF this bill to the floor. Representative Haddad seconds. Any discussion? Uh, thank yes, you. Uh, sorry, I didn't raise my hand. I got to get used to doing that. 
Uh, <laughs> Mr. Chairman, um, I would <laughs> like to uh, move this to a consent calendar. If we can start a consent calendar and we're okay with that for this item. Okay, thank you. Um, so motion made to start a consent calendar. Is there an objection? Is there a second? Second, second made by Representative Master, second by Senator, Senator Sampson. Uh, this item has right number 50 is added to the consent calendar. Thank you. Moving on, item number two, Senate Bill 138, an act concerning presidential electors. Is there a motion? Senator Flexer makes a motion to JF this bill to the floor. Rep. Thomas, second. Any discussion? Senator Sampson, your hand is raised. Uh, yes, your hand is raised. Senator Sampson, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So um, the bill before us, an act concerning presidential electors, essentially what it will do is it will um, uh, get rid of uh, something which is commonly referred to as faithless electors by changing our Connecticut statute to require that the folks selected to represent us as electors in the presidential election, we have seven electoral votes in Connecticut, uh, they will be required to vote uh, with according to the results of the election as published by the Secretary of the State. Um, <clears throat> it's an interesting conversation and uh, the, uh, uh, the bill was introduced by Senator Lesser. We had a good conversation during the hearing. Uh, I certainly support the uh, idea that the electors ought to follow the election and I'm gonna support the bill today, although it really does make me wonder and, and wanna do some research into uh, you know, why we have this process anyway. Why are we putting a person in uh, a position where they can do something alternative to the, elect the actual election results. Uh, there had to be a reason for that, you know, going back to the, uh, the founding of the country. And um, so I I'm gonna uh, just reserve my right to maybe change my mind on the Senate floor if I, uh, if I get some additional information. Uh, but I, I am in support of the concept of the bill and I will support it today. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chair, you're still muted. Sorry, thank you for that. Thank you, Senator Sampson, for your comments. I appreciate your input. It is a fascinating and it is a fascinating concept. There is an interesting OLR report uh, that was provided back in January, uh, which kind of outlines some of the um, what other what other what other states are doing uh, in, in this field. So I refer everyone's attention to that if, if they want further information. Or was it Master Master Francesco? Though your hand is raised, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so I, I do agree that this certainly is an interesting concept. It doesn't really make sense though. I would have to somewhat agree with Senator Sampson that if we are gonna bind our electors, then I believe that we should not have any electors. So um, I understand that 32 states do that right now. Um, so it is my concern that if we are going to do that, then we should have no electors at all just doesn't seem to make any sense, but it is an interesting concept. So for that reason, I'm gonna be a no today. Um, maybe something will change before it gets to the floor, but I'm gonna flag this today with a no for me. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative. I appreciate your comments tonight. Any further questions or comments concerning Senate Bill 138? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Senator Bill 138, Jeff to floor. Flexer. Senator Flexer votes yes. Fox. Representative Fox votes yes. Haskell. Senator Haskell votes yes. Senator, can you repeat that one more time, please? No problem. Senator Haskell votes yes. Thank you. Thomas. Representative Thomas votes yes. Sampson. Senator Sampson votes yes. Mastro Francesco. Representative Mastro Francesco votes no. Blumenthal. Representative Blumenthal. Carpino. Representative Carpino votes yes. 
Fish bank. Representative Fish bank. France. Representative France votes yes. Haddad. Representative Haddad votes yes. Labriola. Representative Labriola. McCarthy Vehi. Representative McCarthy Vehi votes yes. McCrory. Senator McCrory. Morin Bello. Representative Moore and Bellow votes yes. Pom. Rep Pom votes yes. Rosario. Representative Rosario. Santiago. Santiago votes yes. Slap. Santiago votes yes. Thank you, Representative. Senator Slap. All set, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. I think we will make the votes open um, until the rank members have a preference in how long we keep the votes open. Or Senator Fletcher. Any preference? Um, Mr. Chair, I would suggest two hours after the conclusion of the meeting, if that's okay with the clerk, given that I'm praying for a lengthy period in other committees right now. That's fair. Madam Clerk, we'll keep the vote open two hours until, uh, until the meeting is uh, recessed. Understood. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Fletcher. Moving on, item three. Senate Bill 183, an act concerning remote meetings under the Freedom of Information Act. Uh, there's JFS language, JFS LCO 6141. Is there a motion? Uh, Senator Flexer makes a motion for a JFS of Senate Bill 183 to the floor. And a second? Second, second from Representative McCarthy Bahey. Thank you. The JFS language, if I can all advise the committee, uh, is a somewhat minor change. During the public hearing on this bill, we heard particularly from the FOI Commission that it might get rather um, lengthy or complicated if individuals have to continue to introduce themselves upon each, to each time speaking. There's a minor change in line 24 to 26. That has an exception for a person announcing the name when the presenting officer is called upon that person. That is the only change to the underlying bill. Any questions or comments? Senator Sampson, your hand is raised. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, forgive me, I, I'm bouncing between windows here because I was looking at the substitute language. J just to see if I can um, make sure I can uh, address my concerns properly. I guess the first thing I would ask, Mr. Chairman, is yeah. do we know the scope of this bill? Um, it looks to me like it includes pretty much any uh, government authority, which includes uh, the executive branch, uh, municipalities, but, I, but I'm kind of curious whether it covers other things like quasi public agencies um, or the judicial branch, which I understand ju the judicial branch actually has a, has a uh, requirement to, to have public meetings, but uh, it doesn't typically work out that way. Um, I know that they did testify having a concern about the cost of implementing uh, the bill, but I just wanna hear from you, Mr. Chairman, if you could just confirm for me what uh, the scope of the bill is and what and who is covered through you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. Uh, my understanding, Senator, is, is um, it refer to any public agency? So I believe it does not, I believe this does not include quasi-publics. Okay, well, that's certainly helpful. Um, 
I, I guess what I would say about this is that, you know, when the governor's executive order, which this bill is really an extension of, he, he did an executive order early on uh, when uh, the COVID pandemic began, uh, and that was executive order 7B. And essentially the idea was to require, uh, you know, providing public access to electronic meetings, which is something I very strongly uh, appreciate and I'm in favor of. But uh, folks that watch our committee and our public hearings, they know that at the beginning of each public hearing, I've been making a, a statement um, addressing my concern that some aspects of the public, they just simply don't have the technology to participate in um, you know, electronic meetings because they don't have internet access or they don't have the technology, or maybe they're just you know, some older folks that do not understand how to use Zoom or that kind of thing. So I, I guess that's my issue with this bill is I, I want very much to support this bill, but the very first sentence of the bill to me implies that a municipality, for example, or the executive branch can get around having an actual public meeting as long as they have an electronic meeting. And I, I would just, I, I don't wanna go down that road. I, I don't believe that we should be alleviating the requirement for our government, particularly you know, our state or municipal government, which has a direct uh, impact and uh, is responsible to its constituents. Uh, I think that it should uh, maintain uh, in our statutes, we should, we should maintain laws that say that those public meetings have to occur. I, I'm gonna vote no on the bill today, um, but I would just like to give uh, the chairs just, uh, you know, these comments so that there's a way maybe we can work on this going forward so that, um, you know, because I, I, I would like to support it. I mean, I, I believe in, in the concept of the bill. I just, I just hate to get rid of the requirement for a public meeting also simultaneously. And uh, those are my comments today, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Um, as always, very insightful and, and helpful comment. We will take it to heart and keep it in mind as we move forward. We look forward to working with you on this bill. Representative McCarthy Bay, your hand is raised. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. And I'd like to thank you and uh, Co-Chair Flexer for the work that you've done on this. I think it's really an important topic. Um, you are aware, and I just want to make others aware that these uh, Governor's Bill 6448 in the Planning and Development Committee has similar language. And I know we've been in conversation and look forward to ongoing conversation uh, the access to public meetings has been a very hotly discussed and debated item during the course of this pandemic um, in towns and communities throughout the state and certainly here within the General Assembly itself as well. Uh, we have seen, at least in planning and development, and I think this has been true in so many other committees as well, an unprecedented number of people coming before us to testify due to that access to the online meetings. But I would concur with uh, Senator Sampson in that we want to be sure that whenever we can gather in person uh, that we're able to. I know that the ability to also provide access when we have in-person gatherings simultaneously with online access does raise a lot of questions in terms of um, how we address the number of people who will hopefully be engaging with us. That's what we want. We want to open access and we want to engage as many people as we can in the process of democracy as possible. So I'm really grateful uh, that the committee is putting this forward. I do think there will be ongoing conversation and I look forward to that and I will be supporting this today to keep that conversation moving and very much appreciate your efforts. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative. Representative Francesco, your hand is raised. The floor is yours. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So um, I want to just kind of go back to, if you wouldn't mind confirming for me of what Senator Sampson said. I, I am, obviously, I think the Zoom meetings are great. I think the more people that we can have participate in any of our, our public forums and public meetings is, is, a, is a wonderful thing. Um, but again, I am also sensitive to the people that do not have access to the internet. So my biggest concern is, like Senator Sam Sampson said, is will municipalities and agencies still be mandated to have in-person meetings as well. So um, Mr. Chairman, based on the way this bill is written right now, does it give a municipality or an agency or government meeting the option of just doing a meeting via Zoom or electronically and they can no longer do in-person meetings based on the way this is written today? Mr. Chairman. 
Thank you, Representative, for the question. Uh, my reading of the of the underlying bill is that um, they may hold any, any meeting remotely. So they are not mandated to hold it remotely, but it provides them the opportunity to, but does it, does, I, I, my, my reading does not, does not dictate that they must hold an in-person enter, meeting. It, it says provides them the opportunity to hold it remotely. Okay. That question. Yeah, no, it sounds like it's you can do it either way. You can either do it remotely or you can do a meeting in person. That's the way I'm, I'm reading it, if that's correct. And that that is my biggest concern, because I think it's um, like Rep. Senator Sampson and um, McCarthy Fahey mentioned that, you know, transparency, public input. And if they can go out into their town hall or and to participate in those meetings, I think is very important. And I think people want that. There are a lot of people that do not have access to the internet. And there's a lot of people out there that maybe they're just seniors. They want to get out for the night. I had a, when I sat on the town council, we had a couple that came to every single one of our meetings and just sat there and listened because it was a night out for them, a night for them to communicate and to talk to people and just get out and to do something. So I think those are really important that we maintain that. So I'm going to vote no today and hoping that we can continue this conversation and maybe make some changes to it because I really would like to support it because I do believe the um, remote meetings are, are definitely beneficial to everybody. But I also believe that in-person meetings are equally beneficial. So I'm going to be a no today, but let's hope we can work on this going forward. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative, and I uh, appreciate your comments. Look forward to working with you on this bill as well. Senator Haskell, your hand is raised. The floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Very briefly, I just wanted to thank the committee leadership um, for taking up this bill. It is incredibly important in a few of the communities I represent that have really appreciated the opportunity to engage in these remote meetings and I've actually seen robust turnout. Parents who wouldn't otherwise be able to attend a Board of Education meeting uh, listening from their phones as they put their kids to bed and then hopping on to provide public comment at the close of the meeting. So I think that um, it, it's one of the few silver linings of this pandemic. And, and I hope uh, I, I look forward to supporting the bill today. I hope that we're able to move forward with this bill so the government can become more accessible. Thank you for all the work that you and, and Senator mm -hmm. Flexer have done on this. Thank you, Senator. Thank you for bringing this to our attention. And, and we look forward to working with you as well as, as, as the process continues. Any further questions or comments on Senate Bill 183, JFS? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, you please take your roll. Senate Bill 183, LCO 6141, JFS, the floor. Flexer. Senator Flexer votes yes. Fox. Representative Fox votes yes. Haskell. Senator Haskell votes yes. Thomas. Representative Thomas votes yes. Sampson. Senator Sampson votes no. Master Francesco. Representative Master Francesco votes no. Blumenthal. Representative Blumenthal. Carpino. Representative Carpino votes yes. Fishbein. Representative Fishbein. France. Representative France votes no. Haddad. Representative Haddad votes yes. Labriola. Representative Labriola. McCarthy Vehi. Representative McCarthy Vehi votes yes. McCrory. Senator McCrory votes yes. Morin Vello. Representative Morin Vello votes yes. Pom. Rep. Pom votes yes. Rosario. Representative Rosario. 
Santiago. Santiago votes yes. Slap. Senator Slap. Representative Rosario. Representative Rosario votes yes. I'm having some technical issues at the moment. All set, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. So next, moving on, item number four, Senate Bill number 353, an act concerning municipal elections. Is there a motion to JF this bill to the floor? Senator Flexer makes a motion to JF this bill to the floor. Santiago votes second. Motion was made by Senator Flexer, seconded by Representative Santiago. Any discussion? Senator Sampson, your hand is raised. Please proceed. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, so this bill essentially um, is a mandate on towns in Connecticut that hold their elections in um, uh, May rather than November. Um, I, I understand that there's a desire to try and get everybody, uh, you know, on the same kind of schedule, uh, and I'm not, not opposed to that, but I also do believe um, very strongly in local control and um, preventing the state government from interjecting itself in places that it does not belong. And just the way this bill is written, uh, it kind of rubs me the wrong way, because the way it, it is uh, is drafted, it says that a town can change its uh, date of election by a simple majority vote. But if they want to um, go the other way, it requires a two thirds vote. <laughs> so um, I think that, that that's clearly the state trying to, uh, to put its uh, leverage at work to, uh, to get the result that, that it wants. I, I'm just, I'm gonna vote no today just because I believe that um, you know, a town's municipal charter should um, be the, the deciding factor. And that's something that's up to that community to decide and not for us to uh, micromanage them. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator, for your comments. Representative Ashton Francesco, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, a couple concerns I have with this. Again, I obviously believe in local control and autonomy for our municipalities. A question on the charter. So the way this bill is written right now, it would require these towns to open up their charter and do a charter revision commission. Is that correct? If this is written in their charter? Um, I, don't I don't believe that Senator Flex, your hand is raised. Yeah, Mr. Chair, I'm happy to, to chime in and LCO or OLR can certainly correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe um, that these communities actually may not have the main municipal elections in their charters because I don't know if all of them have charters. Some of them may be municipalities that are governed by state statute. Okay, I, I guess I would have to get confirmation confirmation on that. I mean, obviously having a charter revision commission is a big deal to a town. It's, it's a process they, you know, depending, some towns have to open up their charter every time, 10 years for review. So the concern would be if there's a timeline for this, if that town does have to open up their charter to make that change, because I believe that would, would trump with the language in here, would, would it be done in time, number one? Um, so I guess I would just not have to get confirmation on that. So I'm, and, I've, and again, I'm certainly um, believe in local control and if it fits their community to have their elections at a certain time, I think they should be able to continue to do that. So I'm gonna vote no today. Um, and maybe when we get more clarification on it, um, I may change my mind if it comes to the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative. Uh, and we will work with you to get that clarification as Proxima was forced. So thank you. thank you for your comments for bringing that to our attention. Any further comments or questions on Senate, Senate Bill uh, 353? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll? Senate Bill 353, JF to floor. 
Flexer. Senator Flexer, vote yes. Fox. Representative Fox votes yes. Haskell. Senator Haskell. Thomas. Representative Thomas votes yes. Sampson. Senator Sampson votes no. Master Francesco. Representative Master Francesco votes no. Blumenthal. Representative Blumenthal. Carpino. Representative Carpino votes no. Fishbein. Representative Fishbein. France. Representative France votes no. Haddad. Representative Haddad votes yes. Labriola. Representative Labriola. McCarthy Vehi. Representative McCarthy Vehi votes yes. McCrory. Senator McCoy votes yes. Morin Bello. Representative Morin Bello votes yes. Palm. Representative Palm votes yes. Rosario. Representative Rosario votes yes. Can you repeat this one more time, please? Representative Rosario votes. Representative Rosario votes yes. I, I cannot see you, Representative. Your screen is black. Okay, there you go. Oh, okay. okay. Representative Sorry. Rosario votes yes. Thank you. All set. Santiago. Santiago votes yes. Slap. Senator Slap. Senator Slap votes yes. All set, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. On next item number five, Senate Bill 753. And that concerning the counting of incarcerated persons for purposes of determining legislative districts. Motion to JFS LCO 6159 to the floor. Is there a motion? Senator Flexer makes a motion to JFS this bill to the floor. Second. Motion made by Senator Flexer and second by Representative McCarthy Bay. Any discussion? Senator Sampson, your hand is raised. The floor is yours. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I guess I will just start by by asking a, a very simple basic question, which is, what is the policy purpose of this bill? Um, I, I'm just curious to know why why we're we have this before us and, and what it hopes to achieve, or you know what problem does it hope to address? Through you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. Uh, the bill, um, I guess it, it's going to count, I mean, without being, I don't mean to be side, but the, the, the purpose of the bill is to count inmates at their addresses prior to incarceration, as opposed to currently where they're counted, where they are incarcerated. Mr. Chairman, I understand that completely. And, and please, I, I, my question is a completely innocent one. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know we've had this bill before us in the past. I, I'm just, I really don't understand what the goal is. Um, clearly, you know, the folks that are incarcerated are uh, counted as individuals in the census. And I understand that our legislative and municipal voting districts are determined by where people reside. So I understand this might have some sort of impact on those uh, legislative and municipal districts. I, I just, I don't think it's gonna be any kind of significant change. I mean, maybe there's a couple of places in Connecticut where a couple of uh, representative districts might be impacted. 
I just, what I don't understand really is, is, is what the aim of the bill is. I mean, is it the purpose of it to um, modify those legislative districts? I mean, I, to me, that wouldn't be a good reason to do it. Um, I, I just, you know, when we're here crafting public policy, I just, I think it's incumbent upon us to understand why we're making a change and um, to be able to explain, you know, how that benefits our, our state and the system of laws and justice that we, um, that we carry out um, as a state government. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping someone can answer that, that question for me if, if you don't have anything beyond the, um, the description of the bill, because that's kind of where I am also, uh, Representative, is I, I don't know um, what, the, what the ultimate goal is or why. Um, can I ask another question? Uh, Mr. Chairman, the first sentence of the bill, and this, this appears throughout, it says, on or before the first day of May next following the year in which the decennial census of the United States is taken, such and such and such. That implies to me that this bill must pass and become law prior to May 1st of this year if it's going to impact the current um, redistricting process that the legislature's undergoing this year and uh, which it undergoes every 10 years. Uh, basically what I'm saying is, it, does this mean if this bill does not pass by this May 1st, uh, that it would not go into effect until the following redistricting uh, 10 years from now? Do you, Mr. Chairman? I think, Senator, that that is, well, if the language is not changed, that would occur. If the, if the bill gets out of committee today and process, uh, the process continues to the chambers and it's deemed that it's unlikely to meet that time frame, I, I anticipate that would be amended on the floor. That date, if possible, Understood. but as written, as, as written, if it's, unless amended, that you're as, unless amended, and if it's not passed by May first, then your 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 analysis is correct. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, so I'm going to oppose the bill um, for several reasons. I, the very first one is again, I I don't believe that there is a legitimate policy purpose for this bill. I don't believe there is an injustice going on with counting. Um, incarcerated people uh, at their residence address, which happens to be the Department of Corrections um, address that they currently have. Um, that, that's the number one thing is that I don't, I don't think it's a problem. Um, and more importantly, maybe, is that trying to undo that process creates a whole host of other problems because then we are going to essentially use a fictitious address. Um, you know, people have described this bill to me as, as undoing gerrymandering when in fact, I, I believe this bill is in fact creating gerrymandering, uh, which is, um, you know, a process by which we're, we're altering how legislative districts are chosen uh, by manipulating, uh, you know, the population count. And um, essentially what this bill aims to do is ignore the fact that people actually do reside at an address uh, even if that happens to be a, a prison location. Uh, I have a prison in my district. I presume that the census count uh, in the legislative district that I belong to is, is factoring in the population of people that are at the, uh, the prison in Cheshire nearby. Um, and I, I think that's totally fine because the alternative is confusing, Mr. Chairman. Um, if we are not gonna use the address where the person actually is living, then we're using, as I said, a fictitious address. And I think this bill, what it aims to do is use the last known address of someone. But there are people that have been incarcerated for many, many years. Um, who's to say they would ever return to that address? Um, and for that matter, there are people that are serving life sentences um, who will never ever return to that address. So I, it doesn't make sense to me to, to, um, to count someone in an address they will never return to. Um, furthermore, we don't really know that the last known address um, is really reflective of um, what that person would consider their address. Um, I don't know how various things will be handled. It's not addressed in the bill. What if, what if someone lived in um, the town of New Haven their whole life, but then they stayed in a hotel uh, for, for two weeks uh, uh, you know, in a different town prior to committing a, an act that put them in prison? I mean, which, which is their address? Um, I, I just say it doesn't make a lot of sense to me to use a fictitious address for this purpose. And for those reasons, I'm gonna be voting no. Um, and I also wanna point out something to the committee. 
uh, and also to uh, the, the chairs and LCO is that I think there is some confusion in the language where it says, um, and I, I don't want to take up the committee's time, but there's a point in the bill where it says that if someone is counted, um, well, I guess a problem is created if, if someone actually did reside in the same town that they're incarcerated in. Um, the language of the bill leads me to believe that they are not going to be counted at their prison address, but then they cannot be counted at their home last known residential address either. Just the wording of the bill would need to be fixed um, to make sure that that is not uh, misunderstood uh, by anyone uh, trying to make sense of the language. And I, I will leave it right there, uh, Mr. Chairman. I, I just wanna close my comments by saying, I, it doesn't matter to me one way or the other, the way this, this happens or the way people are counted. Uh, my objection to the bill is that I don't believe there's a reason to do this. And more importantly, I think that it creates um, kind of an untrue situation where we're counting people not reflective of what their actual address is. And that, that concerns me because we have to use some um, address that is, that is not accurate. Uh, and there'll be all sorts of confusion about how people are counted. So those are my comments today, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I hope that they are um, they are heard by the committee. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Tams, for your comments. Uh, Senator McCord, your hand is raised. The floor is yours, Senator. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as I'm listening to this conversation around um, this piece of legislation, for all the reasons I I've heard people oppose why they're not supporting this, are all the reasons why I am supporting this bill. We talk about gerrymandering. We talk about false sense of, false sense of identifying where a person resides, where they come from, where they're going. We've been doing this business in Connecticut for far too long. These counts are extremely important, especially when it comes to census, it dictates where resources are going, who needs them, and all kinds of things of that magnitude. So it is extremely important for Connecticut to come around and get with the 21st century and stop, pop, stop counting individuals who are located in correctional facilities as residents of that community. That community doesn't provide any support that community doesn't supply, doesn't support that, that individual, their families or anything. However, the communities where they come from, they still have family there. They're not, they're more than likely gonna return there. And quite frankly, they've never really left. So if for all those reasons and more, and that I don't wanna really discuss, cause I'm really, I really think there's no excuse for us not to be doing this. This is why I think we should be doing this. We have a false count currently. It, at one point when our incarceration population was up over the 17, 18,000, I know specifically 4,000 people from the city of Halford was not counted. But every last one of them more than likely returned there. So I think it's extremely important that we move forward, pass this legislation and stop doing the injustices that we've been doing for individuals, for families, for communities in the state of Connecticut by gerrymandering what we've done currently. So I, I applaud all those who realize that this is important. This is a piece of legislation that we need to move forward. And is a piece of legislation that will get Connecticut out of the doldrums that we are in. So for that being said, I encourage my colleagues to support this measure. Thank you. Thank you, Senator, for your comments. Representative Haddad, your hand is raised, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, I'd like to associate my comments, uh, my thoughts with uh, the comments of uh, Senator McCrory. I think he's um, exactly right in his assessment of the problem. Um, I, I'll, I will just mention just a couple of other things. One is, you know, these these folks do have addresses and state law recognizes their residence address at their last known address. And so it's not um, too much of an extension for us to just acknowledge that 
the record, the address on file is the address that they should be counted at um, while they're involuntarily um, held in a in a prison. Um, more to the point, um, you know, this is consequential, um, and it's consequential to our uh, our representation, our system of representation. You know, currently we have about 23,000 people per house district. Um, but as we enter into redistricting, you should note that the Constitution allows us to have a house um, uh, that, that numbers as much as 225 members. Um, and so let's not presuppose, well, I think it's unlikely that the number of house seats will change. Um, let's not presuppose that the number will stay the same. Um, if we had 225 members in the house, the average district size would, would shrink to about 15,000 people per district. Um, and, uh, and several thousand people housed at a prison could really uh, sort of tip the scales in terms of what's fair and what's um, really honest and op honest representation of a district. To, to take this to its extreme, um, uh, you know, under current law, if we had a prison with, uh, or several collections of prisons, that were close together that enumerated 15,000 prisoners, we'd have a state house district with nothing but prisoners. And, and I know that that's an extreme example, um, but, it is, um, but, but it would be impossible almost to avoid uh, given the current statutory construction. So I think it's time to fix this problem. Um, it's clear that, um, that, uh, that it's important to both to those uh, cities um, and communities where prisoners have been um, form, you know, where, you know, currently reside um, while they um, are incarcerated. Um, but it's equally important to our system of democracy that we don't have districts um, that are uh, systematically undersized uh, because we count uh, prisoners um, temp at their temporary address um, of, a, of, a, of a prison. So I, I urge uh, adoption of the bill. Thank you, Representative Haddad. Any further questions or comments? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll? Senate Bill 753, LCO 6159, JFS to floor. Flexer. Senator Flexer votes yes. Fox. Representative Fox votes yes. Haskell. Senator Haskell. Senator Haskell votes yes. Thomas. Representative Thomas votes yes. Sampson. Senator Sampson votes no. Master Francesco. Representative Master Francesco votes no. Blumenthal. Representative Blumenthal. Carpino. Representative Carpino votes no. Fishbein. Representative Fishbein. France. Representative France votes no. Haddad. Representative Haddad votes yes. Labriola. Representative Labriola. McCarthy Vehi. Representative McCarthy Vehi votes yes. McCrory. Senator McCrory votes yes. Lauren Bello. Representative Lauren Bello votes yes. Palm. Representative Palm votes yes. Rosario. Representative Rosario votes yes. Santiago. Santiago votes yes. Slap. Senator Slap votes yes. All set, Mr. Chair, thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Moving on, item number six, Senate Bill 759, an act concerning gender neutrality in the state constitution. 
Seeing a motion of JFS LCO 6132. Is there a motion? Senator Flexer would make a motion for JFS to the floor. Second. Senator Flexer made the motion. Representative McCarthy made he seconded. Any comments or discussion? Seeing no comments or discussion. Is the ranking member, is this matter consentable or is there like, like we're called both? I'm sorry, <laughs> Mr. Chairman. Um, there was S language on this particular bill. Can you review it for me, please? Yes, of course, all means. Yes, language, LCO 6132, uh, change the date in subsection G from January 1, 2022 to February 1, 2022. Purpose that's line 30 of uh, LCO 6132. Purpose of that was the, um, the reality of coming back in a session in next next year, the, the having a report due on January 1, we just based on our experience in the past seemed somewhat uh, unlikely, a little more difficult or challenging. So we, we kicked it one month, February 1, 2022. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And would you be able to tell me the purpose of this bill? This is the one to change the, uh, to review the state constitution. What is the purpose? It's an, in, in my opinion, it's a historical document. It's been around for hundreds of years. I'm just con concerned. What is the purpose of this? Uh, Senator Flexer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and, and thank you, uh, Representative, for the question. So the purpose of this um, is to convene a task force to review the text of the state constitution. Um, we wanted to convene a task force for just the reason that you referenced uh, representative, which is that it is the constitution of our state. And so changes to it should not be made without careful thought and deliber deliberation. Um, this bill was before this committee two years ago to create a task force to look at all of the language in the constitution and um, evaluate any gendered language and to make recommendations with regard to potentially redrafting the language of the constitution so that it encompasses uh, citizens of all genders. Thank you, um, Senator Flexer. So the task force, um, if you can answer this question for me, the task force that is created, is it equal? Is it when it comes to um, parties? Is there equal representation of both parties on there? Mr. Chairman, thank you. Senator Flexer. Um, the makeup of the task force isn't a partisan makeup. Um, it does use the, the language that we often use in the General Assembly when we're creating task forces. So it has traditional appointments of one for each of the presiding officers in the chambers, one each for the minority and majority leaders, um, and one, excuse me, three for the governor and three for the chief court administrator. So um, the chief court administrator, I'm sure would not, those appointments would not be viewed with a partisan lens. And there's certainly no requirement that Democratic or Republican um, legislators or the governor would have to uh, only appoint people that happen to be of the same party as them. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so it is my opinion when you're talking about reviewing the constitution, it, there should be, it should not be, um, it should be bipartisan. And there should be equal representation of both parties to review to the any study. I understand that we put a lot of task force together and let's be honest, they are partisan, right? The majority, they have uh, the majority of their people on there. When it comes to the constitution, it should be completely bipartisan all the way. And there should not be a majority of one party on there. So um, for that reason, I'm gonna be voting no on this, but thank you uh, for your explanation. Mr. Chair, can I clarify? Yes, please proceed, Senator Flexer. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative, I apologize. I misspoke. Um, there is no appointment for majority leaders in the bill that is currently before us. So it actually is equal. Um, if you were looking at the appointing authorities through a, a, a completely partisan um, lens, there would be one Republican in the House who'd be able to appoint people, there'd be one Democrat in the House who'd be able to appoint people. There's one Republican in the Senate who'd be able to appoint people and one Democrat in the Senate who's able to appoint people. 
Correct. Thank you. But the governor can appoint three people. Am I, is that correct? So there's no provision in there to make sure that whoever the governor appoints, that it's bipartisan. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair. Um, again, yes, the governor does have three appointments, um, but the chief court administrator also has three appointments, which would assuredly have no partisan uh, representation and no, or there would be no partisan lens that those appointments would be made through. Right, but, I, there's, but there's nothing so in there that states that. Is that correct? There are no Sorry. requirements around party affiliation in terms of who may be appointed to this body. But knowing how these task forces have worked in the past, I'm sure that the appointing authorities, all of them, would be quite happy to have recommendations from members of this committee or members of the public as to who should serve on this task force once it's formed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, um, Senator Flexer. I, I understand, but a, a recommendation um, doesn't necessarily, in my mind, mean that it's going to be bipartisan. So I appreciate you answering those questions. Um, I have nothing else, uh, Mr. Chairman, but I'll be voting no today. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. <clears throat> Senator Haas, your hand is raised. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I just want to uh, briefly commend Senator Flexer uh, and yourself for all of the work that's been put into this legislation. Obviously, a task force is just the start, but I think it's important that High school students, middle school students, even elementary school students, when they read the state constitution, feel as though um, they they can see themselves in that document. And uh, our, I think our current state constitution falls short. I raised my hand though, just to push back slightly on the notion that our constitution is is so historic that it can't um, that it can't or shouldn't be changed. The state constitution was adopted via referendum in 1965, uh, and since that time, it's been amended 31 times. So. We change the state constitution every so often to reflect uh, Connecticut's values and change in values. And I think that this is an important area where as we become a more inclusive state, we ought to have a, a constitution that reflects that inclusivity. So thank you, Mr. Chair, for your work on this. And thank you, Senator Flexen. Thank you, Senator Ask. We're up to match this for your hands raised, but can I move to Senator Sampson for the first time? Senator Sampson for the first time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I really didn't want to get into the a debate on this particular bill. I'm, I'm happy to just uh, oppose it and let it let it go on. I just it, the thing is, the reason why this bill is before us is because it is under. Um, I guess some people have the impression that our constitution is written in language that is somehow sexist um, because it refers to like very the very first sentence uh, of the Article One is all men when they form a social compact are equal in rights and no man or set of men and so on. And I, and I get that some people might be sensitive to that, but I, I would just remind everyone that, that that's English. Um, and it is a very common um, way to describe people of both genders um, by referring to them as men. And it's been going on since uh, English was devised. Our uh, Declaration of Independence for the country says all men are created equal. And it is my uh, belief they were referring to all men and all women of all nationality of races and colors. Um, and that's quite clear because the point they were trying to make is that all men, inclusive of everyone I just mentioned, are in fact created equal and have equal rights. And while governments, including our own, may have not respected the rights of every person, race, based or gender based throughout history, their rights have always been equal. And that's not been in question since the beginning. I, I don't see a purpose, um, Mr. President or Mr. Chairman for this, this bill. We don't need to change the language in the constitution. It does apply to women and men equally. That is just um, a form of English that has accepted, widely accepted and been used in many uh, documents. I understand that today, this type of usage is less common, um, but nonetheless, it is still the proper use of English. And I'll just make a side note that uh, I do believe of all the committees that I've ever served on in this General Assembly, this is the one that needs an English professor more than any other, <laughs> since we've had to debate the, uh, the meaning of uh, Article 6 and the uh, uh, absentee balloting and whether it applies to individuals or groups, uh, which to me is also very, very simple, plain English. 
Um, and uh, I really wish we had somebody here to, uh, to remind us what the English language consists of. Uh, and that's all, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator. Representative Master Pinesk, your hand is raised for the second time. Please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I actually just had a, a quick question. The last time when I was speaking back and forth with Senator Flexer, when I finished my comments, I went to go to mute myself and I noticed that I was already muted. So I just wanted to make sure that I was heard on the record. Was, was I muted when I was speaking? No. Okay. That, you're, you're, you're muted now, Representative Fox. <laughs> Go figure. No, I did not mute you, and uh, we heard everything you said. Who's that first? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, thank, thank, thank you so much. Thank you, Representative. Representative Thomas, your hand is raised. The floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair, but now I'm afraid I'm muted. <laughs> thank you so much for your support of this bill. Um, I'm just remembering testimony we heard in this committee about, uh, it was from a high school student, a young girl. It was on a different bill, but she said something very impactful about not seeing herself in these government documents and how we will never know the cost um, to young women when we use this language that uh, makes us automatically exclude ourselves from, you know, society, if you will. So um, with all due respect, I hope we never use the um, uh, excuse, if you will, that just because something has always been done a certain way, that that is uh, de facto the right way to do it. So I'm happy to support this bill and open up the conversation and have the task force at least look at it to see if we can come up with a workable solution. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Thomas. Any further questions or comments? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll? Senate Bill 759 LCO 6132, JFS to floor. Flexer. Senator Flexer votes yes. Fox. Representative Fox votes yes. Haskell. Senator Haskell. Thomas. Representative Thomas votes yes. Sampson. Senator Sampson votes no. Master Francesco. Representative Master Francesco votes no. Blumenthal. Representative Blumenthal. Carpino. Representative Carpino votes no. Fishbein. Representative Fishbein. France. Representative France votes no. Haddad. Representative Haddad votes yes. Labriola. Representative Labriola. McCarthy Vahey. Representative McCarthy Vahey votes yes. McCrory. Senator McCrory votes yes. Morin Bello. Representative Morin Bello votes yes. Palm. Representative Palm votes yes. Rosario. Representative Rosario. Santiago. Santiago votes yes. Slap. Mr. Slap votes yes. All set, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. We're now going to move on to item number seven, Senate Bill 761. An act permitting the use of citizens' elections program grant funds to offset participating candidate child care costs. Looking for a JFS LCO 6040 to the floor. Is there a motion? Senator 
Flexer makes a motion to JFS this bill to the floor. Representative Thomas seconds. Motion made by Senator Flexer, seconded by Senator by Representative Thomas. I will say for the committee's information, the JFS language, LCO 6041, uh, changed the effective date of the bill to July 1, 2021. It had been October 1, 2021, but changed, changed to July 1, 2021. Any questions, comments, or discussion? Representative Bellow, your hand is raised. The floor is yours. Thank you, Chair Fox. Um, I just wanted to make sure I understood the child care costs would follow it, the existing SEEK guidelines. Um, for instance, family members would not be able to be paid for that service and um, also that there's a threshold for these allowable expenses. Uh, that's correct. Yes, thank you, uh, Representative. The, the section pertaining to the needed family members not being paid is lines, I believe it's 84 to lines 84 to 85 indicate that the candidate and any member of his immediate family should not receive this compensation. And the threshold for funds that are available are the, the amount of uh, qualifying contributions raised by the candidate. So for state reps, and that's lines 21 to 23, I believe. State representatives uh, limited at $5,000. State senators limited at $15,000. Thank you, I appreciate that. I wanna make sure that uh, folks realize that the, the funds won't be misused for you know, a sibling watching another sibling or a, you know, anything like that, that there are these um, uh, guidelines in place to make sure that you know, it's appropriately, the funds are appropriately used for childcare. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Representative. Uh, Senator Sampson, your hand is raised. The floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I also wanted to address that um, section that, that pertains to the limits on the um, use of these funds. Um, I would still say that, uh, I don't know exactly what the amount is for, for state Senate these days, but it's around $15,000. And um, I would just say that is, a, a tremendous number, um, considering the duration of a uh, campaign for legislative office, et cetera, uh, for um, the use of, of child care expenses. And for statewide office, it's, it's, it's off the chart. It's, you know, it could be as much as 75,000 or, or more. Um, I, I'm going to oppose this bill, but I, you know, it's one of those things, uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I don't believe that when the Citizens Election Fund was created that the um, people that supported it, um, and that when I say people, I'm referring to the public at large, um, I don't believe, number one, that they, um, if we, we polled the public today, that they would be overwhelmingly in favor of taxpayer-funded campaigns to begin with. And I certainly don't believe that they would be in favor of taxpayer uh, funded campaigns where the camp candidates themselves can use those dollars for personal use, including childcare. I, I just don't believe that's something that would be popular with the public. And I don't believe that my constituents would support something like that. And that's my reason for voting no. Um, and, I, and I'll be completely honest with the committee, which is that, that um, if this happened in a race with me, I, I would point it out that my opponent is using uh, funds that they're supposed to be campaigning for office on for childcare. Um, I'm certainly sympathetic to someone that needs to cover their childcare costs, but that's, we live in a country where, you know, um, there's tremendous opportunity and um, it's the responsibility of individuals to take care of themselves and their own concerns. Um, you know, I, I didn't run for office, uh, Mr. Chairman, until I was financially able to do so. Uh, because I knew that it was my responsibility to pay my bills and still maintain my mortgage and feed myself and that sort of thing. Um, and I knew it was going to result in a significant, significant loss of income for me uh, to run for legislative office. Um, I, I just don't see that that's the purpose of having the Citizens Election Fund. And um, I, I don't also don't think it's something our constituents would support. And, and I, I just think it's a, it's, a, it's a bad move for a candidate 
uh, to put themselves in a position of, of telling their constituents that they're using their money for that purpose. And uh, I'll leave it there. Thank you, Madam Chair, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator, for your comments. Representative Thomas Chandler, raise the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. I find myself, I'm constantly reminded of testimony uh, that people gave during the public hearings on these matters. And I remember someone saying that no one runs for office for free childcare. And that really stayed with me. I don't have children, but I could certainly empathize with someone who does want to serve the public, but has a very real concern. Um, you know, I have a different viewpoint. I, I, people I've spoken with have been very supportive of this legislation because they know that this one barrier has held them back perhaps from considering running for office or um, might hold back someone that they know. Um, and I, for one, would much rather see the dollars go this way than for T-shirts, stickers, buttons, <laughs> et cetera, which I think does no good for society um, and has no bearing on whether or not someone um, is able to run. So I very much support this bill. And thank you for the time, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Thomas. Representative McCarthy Bay, your hand is raised. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I appreciate your efforts. And as someone who only had two children when I first ran for office and now has three and used to bring um, my children out on the campaign trail with me, uh, I think this is a really important bill for us to support. It's allowed at the federal level and in a number of other states. Uh, I do, I think that it's very, knocking on doors when you think about campaigning is something that can be done uh, as an individual candidate at very little cost. But if you're a single parent, whether a dad or a mom, and are unable to do that, uh, it's really hard to do and to make that kind of contact with voters. So I think it's important for us to be able to have a diverse set of representatives here at the Capitol. And this is a way that we can advance that opportunity for a number of folks. And I'm grateful for the work that's been done on this bill to date. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Master Francesca, your hand is raised, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just a couple of quick comments that I, um, I, I agree that I don't believe the citizens election program was intended for that purpose. I, I do wanna give people an opportunity certainly to run for office and I know it can be very difficult and challenging especially when you have young children. I remember when I ran years ago um, that my kids used to walk and knock on doors with me. So I understand the challenges, but I don't believe that that was the intent of the program. And I also think of our seniors that are home where there's candidates maybe at home taking care of their, their mom and dad and they can't, um, they can't uh, run for office because of that reason or somebody over the age of four, 13 that is maybe handicapped and their parents, their, some of the candidate is home taking care of them that doesn't cover. So I guess my concern is, you know, where does this end? What, what will be next? Um, do we use it for any source, any type of care for any family members? Um, like I said, I don't believe this was the intent of the bill. And I don't believe when I'm out fundraising for my campaign that my constituents would want me to use the money they gave me for for debt for, de for child care, um, but I because I do understand that there's a max and it only falls within the money that the candidate um, raises. So so I guess technically somebody can argue, well, you're not using uh, taxpayer dollars; you're using the money the candidate raises. But I don't believe that my constituents or many uh, constituents out there would want them using the money that they raised that they gave them to go directly towards child care or any other expenses. So. Uh, for those reasons, I'll be voting no today, but thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative, for your commentary. Representative Carpino, your hand is raised, the floor is yours. Thank you, sir. I just want to make a point. We, we talk about how our young people uh, see themselves and how very important it is for what we do here to resonate with 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 the children we have who will be our future. And, and I'm, I'm struggling listening to this conversation because over the years, 
my kids knock doors with me. They come to events with me. And I, I was a candidate like none other. Over the years now, I have more than my two kids. I have my two kids and their friends, who I have to be honest, are probably the most effective campaigners I've had at you know, six and 10 over the years. I'm torn over this bill for, for some of the flaws, or I'll, I'll say shortcomings that uh, my ranking member mentioned that I brought up in the public hearing are, are children, are only children once, and I think it is amazing for them to take part in the campaign process so that they can see themselves in our shoes in the future. And we do have parents with children who are a bit older than the age in this bill and who do have significant needs. And if we're looking to include parents, we should include them. I will support this today, sir, but I do think we need to look at some of these issues going forward before I can commit on the floor. I recognize that it is limited. I would never use this money for childcare because frankly, the childcare needs of a candidate are nothing compared to the childcare need of an active state rep serving their district, but I understand the intention. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Representative Corvino, for your comments. Well taken and appreciated. Representative Rosario, your hand is raised, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I will be supporting this in the committee. And I, I, I too, like many parents, I brought my children out on the campaign trail. Um, I have one child who's an extrovert and I have one child who's an introvert. And bringing them out on the campaign trail could be a tra tra traumatic experience uh, for, for children, and including one of my children who after the fact told me, he said, you know, dad, you know, I, I, I really enjoy spending time with you, but I get really nervous when I'm around a lot of people. So uh, something like this would definitely go uh, a long way for those children that may not be as extroverted as their parents uh, who choose to seek public office. So uh, I will be supporting this in the committee. Thank you, Representative, for your comments. Any further questions or comments on the online bill? If not, will the clerk please call the roll? JFS, the floor, LCO 6040. Senate Bill 761, LCO 6040, JFS to floor. Flexer. Senator Flexer votes yes. Fox. Representative Fox votes yes. Haskell. Senator Haskell. Thomas. Representative Thomas votes yes. Sampson. Senator Sampson votes no. Master Francesco. Representative Master Francesco votes no. Blumenthal. Representative Blumenthal votes yes. Carpino. Representative Carpino votes yes. I'm sorry, Representative, can you please repeat it one more time? Sure, Representative Carpino votes yes. Thank you. Fishbein. Representative Fishbein. France. Representative France votes yes. Haddad. Representative Haddad votes yes. Labriola. Representative Labriola. McCarthy Vehi. Representative McCarthy Vehi votes yes. McCrory. Senator McCrory. Senator McCrory votes yes. I will say. Morin Bello. Representative Morin Bello votes yes. Palm. Rep Palm votes yes. Rosario. Representative Rosario votes yes. Santiago. Santiago votes yes. Slap. Senator Slap votes yes. Haskell. Senator Haskell votes yes. All set, Mr. Chair, thank you. 
Thank you, Madam Clerk. Moving on, item number eight, Senate Bill number 1013, an act concerning legislative commissioners' recommendations for technical revisions to the government administration election statutes. Is there a motion to JF to the floor? Senator Flexer makes a motion to JF this bill to the floor. And a second. Second. Motion made by Senator Flexer, seconded by, I believe, Representative McCarthy Behe. Any discussion or commentary? Senator Tapson, your hand is raised. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, during our caucus uh, of the uh, uh, Republicans, we didn't. There was no uh, objection to this bill. So, uh, if you'd like to uh, add this to our consent calendar, I don't think you'll have an objection. Thank you. Motion made to add the consent calendar. Is there a second? I'm not sure. Is there a second? Second. Second, or Reverend Thomas. Well, I'm not sure. You know, so I need one. Any objection? No objection. The motion will be added to the consent calendar. Thank you, Senator Sampson. Moving on. Item number nine, Senate Bill number 1014, an act concerning a municipal election monitor for the 2021 municipal election and the 2022 state election. Jim, we're looking for a motion to JF to the floor. Is there a motion? Senator Flexer makes a motion to JF this bill to the floor. And a second. Senator Sampson. Second. Motion made by Senator Flexer, I think seconded by Senator Slap, I believe. Any discussion or comments? Senator Sampson, your hand is raised, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would recommend this for the consent calendar also. Thank you, Senator. Any objection out of this to the consent calendar? Seeing none, to confirm with LCO, do we need a second to add something to the consent calendar to confirm with LCO? Second. No, Mr. Chair, I, you know, traditionally you can say if there's no objection, you can add okay. to the consent calendar. Thank you. If there's no objection, we'll add this to the consent calendar. Seeing none, thank you, Senator Sampson, again. Moving on, now item number 10, Senate Bill 1016, an act concerning municipal ethics. Looking for a motion to JF this to the floor. Is there a motion? Senator Flexer makes a motion to JF this bill to the floor. And Representative second. Thomas, second. Motion was made by Senator Flexer, second by Representative Thomas. Any discussions or questions? Representative Master Francesca, your hand is raised. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, can you just do a quick overview of the, the bill? Of course, yes. Bill has been before our committee before. I think we had it at least last last two years got out of the actually made it out of the Senate. I think it got on consent in 2019. Was not was not called in the House. It requires each municipality to adopt and maintain a municipal code of ethics by October 1, 2022. Um, if a municipality already has a code of ethics, it does not need to do anything other than notify or file with the state of office state ethics that it that does so. Uh, requires OSC the office of state ethics. To consultation with the CCM and costs, develop a model municipal ethics code for municipalities that do not yet have a code of their own to, to refer to, and post a code on its website by January 1, 2022. And the OSC must update the model as it deems necessary. By January 15, 2023, each municipality must submit a notice to OSC certifying whether it has complied with those requirements and providing a copy of its code. So essentially, by January 15, 2023, each municipality must notify the OSC by filing that it has complied with, with the underlying obligation of the bill and submit a copy of its code. And then by January 1, 2024, OSC is to, to report back to this committee uh, the process and status of the underlying uh, uh, municipal ethics that are, that are in place. Is that helpful, Representative? Yeah, it does. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And is there a standard code of ethics that the municipality is required to follow, Mr. Chairman? Thank you for the question, it's a very good one. Currently, no. The idea being, my understanding is that if municipalities currently have a code of ethics, they can simply, that they're, they're in compliance. For those that do not, the Office of State Ethics will be working with CCM and cost to put together a model for those municipalities that, that don't currently have a code to refer to, possibly adopt if necessary, or at least use, use it as a base level for what they're the, the, for an adop in adopting a model code. Okay. okay, thank you. And then do we know, um, Mr. Chairman, how many towns do not have a code of ethics? Do, do we know that before? Uh, that's a very good question. I think it came up 
if I recall, I think we asked this question during the public hearing to OSC, and I think they indicated that CCM and possibly cost had reached out to the towns to inquire. And, and I, I believe there's very few that don't have some sort of, I don't know the exact number, but I believe there's very few that do not have some, some sort of code of ethics, but I, I don't I do not know the exact number offhand. Okay, Th thank you. Yeah, it sounds to me, if I can recall correctly through public hearing that there's very few towns that don't have a code of ethics. Um, so, you know, for that reason, I'm gonna vote no on this today, only because I think it's heavy handed for the state to get involved in municipal um, regulation. And, um, you know, again, I believe in local control. I, the, the, obviously the municipalities are doing the right, right thing now. We have very few. If there are a few that do not have a code of conduct, a code of ethics, I would, re, you know, obviously you're gonna, you encourage them, but I think it's a little heavy handed for us to, to pass policy uh, requiring them since they are doing it now. So for those reasons, I'll be a no today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Thank you for your thoughtful comments and insights. Representative Thomas Randis, raise the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just if it's helpful referring to my notes, um, they testified that 20 to 30 towns were missing such codes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative. Senator Flex, your hand is raised. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And similar to Representative Thomas, I just did want to add to the discussion that I believe um, when we first started having this conversation in the committee several years ago, it was brought to us by uh, people from municipalities that did not have codes of ethics and, and that, that there was this vacuum of ethical standards, if you will. And so that's why these conversations were initiated and, and carefully and deftly, I believe, negotiated by the Office of State Ethics to try to find the, a baseline for every community to follow. And I think it is close to 30 municipalities that have no code of ethics currently. Thank you, Senator. Any further questions or comments? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll? Senate Bill 1016, Jack to floor. Flexer. Senator Flexer votes yes. Fox. Representative Fox votes yes. Haskell. Senator Haskell votes yes. Thomas. Representative Thomas votes yes. Sampson. Sorry, couldn't find my mute button there. <laughs> Senator Sampson votes no. Master Francesco. Representative Master Francesco votes no. Blumenthal. Representative Blumenthal uh, votes yes. Carpino. Representative Carpino votes yes. Fishbein. Representative Fishbein. France. Representative France votes no. Haddad. Representative Haddad votes. Representative Haddad votes uh, yes. Thank you. Labriola. Representative Labriola. McCarthy Vehi. Representative McCarthy Vehi. Representative McCarthy Vehi votes yes. McCrory. Senator McCrory votes yes. Morin Bello. Rep Morin Bello votes yes. Palm. Rep Palm votes yes. Rosario. Representative Rosario votes yes. Santiago. Santiago votes yes. Slap. Senator Slap votes yes. All set, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Moving on, item number 11, Senate Bill 1052, an act concerning a disparity study. 
We were J F to the floor. Is there a motion? Senator Fletcher makes a motion to J F this bill to the floor. Second by Santiago. Motion made by Senator Fletcher, seconded by Senator Representative Santiago. Any questions or comments? Senator Sampson, your hand is raised. The floor is yours. Please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd just like to uh, offer this for potential addition to our consent calendar. Thank you, Senator. Is there an objection to this to the consent calendar? Seeing none, thank you, Senator, for the motion. We'll add this to the consent calendar. Moving on, item number 12, Senate Bill 1072, an act concerning freedom of information. Is there a motion to JF this to the floor? Senator Flexer makes a motion to JF this bill to the floor. Is there a second? Rep. Thomas seconds. Motion made by Senator Flexer, seconded by Representative Thomas. Any discussion or comment? Senator Sampson, your hand is raised, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Again, another item that I think would go nicely on our consent calendar. Is there an objection to this item being added to the consent calendar? Seeing none, thank you, Senator Sampson, for the motion. This will be added to the consent calendar. Next, moving on to item number 13. Senate Bill 1075, an act concerning payroll service providers. Is there a motion to JF this to the floor? Senator Flexer makes a motion to JF this bill to the floor. And a second? Second by Santiago. Second. Motion made by Senator Flexer, and I believe second by Representative Moran Bello. Any question or comments on the amount bill? Senator Sampson, your hand is raised, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we had a very similar bill um, in the Labor Committee recently, and I believe it uh, passed unanimously. And uh, again, since we were on a roll, uh, let's add this one to the consent calendar with no objections. Thank you. Any objections to the consent calendar? Seeing none, the matter we added to the consent calendar. Thank you, Senator. Moving on, item number 14, Senate Bill 1076. An act concerning public-private partnerships and privatization of the state service at the University of Connecticut Health Center. Center. Motion to JF to the floor. Senator Flexer makes a motion to JF this bill to the floor. Representative Haddad seconds. Motion made by Senator Flexer, second by Representative Haddad. Any questions or comments? Senator Sampson, are we going to continue the momentum? The floor is yours. Mr. Chairman, yes. I hope the rest of the committee members acknowledge. I know some of them uh, are tired of hearing me speak on occasion. I hope they will remember this day where I am uh, actively adding items to a consent calendar. And I think this would be a great addition, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. Any objection to this item? This being added to the consent calendar. Seeing none, this will be added to the consent. Thank you, Senator Sampson. Up um, next, under 15, House Bill 5011, an act concerning the copying of public records under the Freedom of, the Freedom of Information Act. Is there a motion to JF this to the floor? Senator Flexer makes a motion to JF this bill to the floor. And a second. Rep. Thomas, second. Motion well, made by Senator Flexer, second by Representative Thomas. Any question or comment? Representative Master Francesco, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We have no objections uh, to this, and I would move to put this on the consent calendar. Any objections to adding this to the consent calendar? Seeing none, thank you, Representative. Appreciate your help. It's better to be added to the consent calendar. We're going to have number 16, House Bill 6203, an act exempting certain records concerning Native American cultural knowledge from the public disclosure under the Freedom of Information Act. Motion to JF to the floor. Is there a motion? Senator Flexer, Flexer makes a motion to JF this bill to the floor. Representative Rep. Thomas, second. second. Motion. motion made by Senator Flexer, I believe second by Rep. Representative, Representative Haddad. Any questions or comments? Senator Representative Master Francesca, your hand is raised. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And once again, we have no objections to this. I would offer this to our consent calendar. Is there an objection out of this consent calendar? Seeing none, the matter will be added to the consent calendar. Thank you, Representative. 
Moving on, item number 17, House Bill 6573, and I concern the Commissioner for Education Technology. Is there a motion, JFS, JFS the floor? Senator Flexer makes a motion to JFS the, excuse me, to JF this bill to the floor. And a second. Second, Rep. Moran Bellow. Motion made by Senator Flexer, second by Representative Moran Bellow. Is there a discussion? Representative Max Francesca, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would ask, we did have a, I, I think some of our members may have a question on this item. Um, so I would ask that we do a roll on this one. Thank you, ma'am. Any questions or comments? Would you like us to do the roll call now, Representative Max Francesca, or hold off? Um, I thought we had, I'm sorry. Senator Sampson's hand is raised. Okay, thank you. Senator Sampson, your hand is raised. The floor is yours. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I just, uh, I wanted to vote no on this bill. No, no need to uh, debate it, um, but I uh, would like a roll call vote. Uh, and really it's just that back in 2013, uh, these members were removed uh, from this committee. And uh, I'd be lying if I could tell you exactly what the debate was, but I did vote in favor of it back in the day. <laughs> I just think it would be uh, unusual of me to, to vote to remove them then vote to put them back on. Um, so I just want to remain consistent, Mr. Chairman. So I'd like to uh, have a roll call vote. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Appreciate your insight and your, if anything, your consistency. So I appreciate that. Any further questions? Senator Flex, your hand is raised. The floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I would, uh, through you, Mr. Chair, I just wonder if the good Senator would mind telling us what that that bill was in 2013. That's okay if you don't, that's okay. If he doesn't remember, no, it, it, it's inconsequential. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator. I think that's almost nervous here, Senator Sampson. They're past voting records. Any further questions or comments on the underlying bill? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll? House Bill 6573, Jeff to floor. Correct, sir. Senator Flexer votes yes. Fox. Representative Fox votes yes. Haskell. Senator Haskell votes yes. Thomas. Representative Thomas votes yes. Sampson. Senator Sampson votes no. Senator, can you repeat that one more time, please? Sorry about that. I, oh. Was it me you didn't hear or, or Senator uh, McCurry? I'm no, sorry. I heard you. I just need to see you on the main screen. Uh, so one more time, please. Senator Sampson votes no. Thank you. Thank you. Master Francesco. Representative of Master Francesco votes yes. Blumenthal. Representative Blumenthal votes yes. Carpino. Representative Carpino votes yes. Fishbein. Representative Fishbein. France. Representative France votes yes. Haddad. Representative Haddad votes yes. Labriola. Representative Labriola. McCarthy Vehi. Representative McCarthy Vehi votes yes. McCrory. Senator McCrory votes in affirmative. That means yes. <laughs> I didn't hear camera, Senator. Thank you. Morin Bello. Representative Morin Bello votes yes. Palm. Rep. Palm votes yes. Rosario. Representative Rosario votes yes. Santiago. Santiago votes yes. Slap. Senator Slap votes yes. All set, Mr. Chair. Thank you.
Thank you, Madam Clerk. You're going to now move on. Can everyone, can everyone hear me? Oh, good. Sorry, I got a little. Move on now to item number 18, House Bill 6574, not concerning revisions to the State Code of Ethics. This is a JFS to the floor. Uh, give me one second. JFS LCO 6180 to the floor. Is there a motion? Senator Flexer makes a motion to JFS this bill to the floor. Is there a second? I didn't hear Rep. A second. Thomas seconds. Motion made by Senator Flexer, second by Representative Thomas. The JFS language, this was uh, following a comment made by FDFY Commission. Who would agree? Who was in agreement with? O, who agree, who was in agreement with OSC? Uh, it's section three of the bill to def further define the phrase confidential information. Makes the definition a little more limited as requested by FYC and, uh, and agreed to by the OSC. Any questions or comments? Senator Sampson, your hand is raised. The floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to take a, a brief moment to uh, thank the Office of State Ethics. Uh, for their hard work and, and diligence uh, on behalf of the citizens of Connecticut. Um, they, they do a tremendous job. And this bill is just another example of them constantly staying on top of the um, ever-changing uh, world we live in and the uh, ethical considerations that, uh, that come up from time to time. Um, I have great respect for that uh, state agency, may, possibly uh, more than any other. And uh, I just wanted to, just to put that out there. And uh, I heard support of this bill. In fact, um, even though it's a House bill, I, I will make it the recommendation. I don't believe there are any objections on our side of the aisle. So if uh, it might be a good candidate for the consent counter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Sams. Any objections on this to the consent calendar? Seeing none, the matter will be added to the consent calendar. Thank you, Senator Sampson. Moving on to item number 19. House Bill 6663, an act revising certain campaign finance statutes. Looking for a motion to JF to the floor. Is there a motion? Senator Flexer makes a motion to JF this bill to the floor. Second, second. by second by Santiago. Motion well, made by Senator Flexer, second by Representative Santiago. Any discussions or, or comments? Representative Master Francesca, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. With no objection, I'd like to offer this item to the consent calendar. Any objection to adding this item to the consent calendar? Seeing none, the item, the item we added to our consent calendar. Thank you, Representative. I believe the only business we have remaining is the vote in the consent calendar. Madam Clerk, when you're ready. Consent calendar includes items 1, 8, 9, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 18, and 19. That's correct. Flexer. Senator Flexer votes yes. Fox. Representative Fox votes yes. Haskell. Senator Haskell votes yes. Thomas. Representative Thomas votes yes. Sampson. Senator Sampson votes yes. Master Francesco. Representative Master Francesco votes yes. Blumenthal. Representative Blumenthal votes yes. Carpino. Representative Carpino votes yes. Do you see I've, me, Madam Clerk? Yes, now I see you. Thank you. Fishbein. Representative Fishbein. France. 
Representative France votes yes. Haddad. Representative Haddad votes yes. Labriola. Representative Labriola. McCarthy Vehi. Representative McCarthy Vehi votes yes. McCrory. Senator McCoy votes yes. Uh, Moran Bello. Representative Moran Bello votes yes. Tom. Tom votes yes. Rosario. Representative Rosario votes yes. Santiago. Santiago votes yes. Slap. Senator Slap votes yes. All set, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. I think uh, being now it's probably, why don't we keep the meeting open until 5 p.m. That works to rank members. Sure. So keep it open for another two hours, 5 p.m. Is that, that okay with you, Madam Clerk? Yes, Mr. Chair. Thank you. I want to thank all the committee members for their efforts and patience today and appreciate the dialogue uh, that we've had today and our efforts of working together. We have, I think we anticipate having another meeting uh, this Wednesday to jam some more bills. So we look forward to, uh, to that meeting and the conversation that I had between now and then. So thank you all for your time. The meeting will, will be in recess until 5 p.m. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I think I might have missed a vote or two. I was having some technical issues earlier. I just have to go through them. Give me a second, please. No worries, thank you. Okay, you missed the vote on Senate Bill 138. Can you uh, repeat what that was again? Yeah. An act concerning presidential electors. electors. Yeah, I'd like to vote in the affirmative. Senate Bill 759, that was JFS, LCO 6132, an act concerning gender neutrality in the state constitution. I would like to vote in the affirmative on that as well, please. All set. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Thank guys. You. Hi, Valentina. Um, I don't know if, I, if there's anyone ahead of me, but I'm ready to vote uh, when you are. Okay. Just one second, please. It's, you missed the vote on Senate Bill 138. Okay. Like What's the title of that bill? Sorry again. No, it's okay. Uh, an act concerning presidential electors. Uh, I'd like to vote yes on that bill. Senate Bill 183, this was JFS LCO 6141. Uh, I would like and to vote yes on that bill. Senate Bill 353. Uh, I would like to vote yes on that bill.
Senate Bill 753. Uh, I vote yes. Senate Bill 759. I vote yes. That's it, you're all set, Representative. Great, thanks. Thanks. Have a good one. You too, thank you. Hi, Senator Slack. Hey, you ready? Uh, let me just, <laughs> I, I didn't have time to remove the ones from the consent calendar, so I just have to go through them each time until I get a second. Let me see what you missed. Okay. Yeah, I, I think I missed the first four, that's it. Okay, um, so Senate Bill 138. Yes. Senate Bill 183. Yes. You voted on Hello, did I miss any votes? Uh, I'm just sitting before it. Just one, uh, Senator, Senator, second. Uh, Senator Slack, you're all set. You only missed two votes. Thank you. Senator, you I will check you now. It's over. It's over. I'm done for the day. Go get Senate Bill 138. Yes. That's it, you're all set, Senator. Okay, thank you. Thanks.
Hello? Hi, Representative. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? Good, good. Uh, thank you. I want to cast my vote. I'm just, I'm just, uh, I'm almost to my house, and then I'm going to uh, uh, give myself video and vote. Oh, so I'll um, just, I'd... I'll just mute you, and then you can um, mute, unmute yourself when you're ready to vote. Okay. Okay. Hi, Senator How are you doing? I'm okay. How are you? I'm good. Are you in the middle of something else, or could I cast a few votes? No, I'm actually finding the votes that you missed. Um, so you missed Senate Bill 353. Senator Haskell votes yes. Senate Bill 759. Senator Haskell votes yes. Yeah, that's it. You're all set, Senator. Thank you so much. Have a great day. You too. Thank you. Okay, Rep Labriola here. All right. Let's see. Um, so, would you like me to read the titles, Representative? Or um, you missed all the votes, I believe. So. Um, yeah, I, I missed know. them all. Uh, yeah. So, um, all right, I'm ready to go. Uh, let's see. We had a consent calendar too, right? Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's probably going to be easier for you to read off the bills, right? What's easier for you? Oh, I will definitely read the bill. I just don't know if you would like me to also read the title of the bill. You don't have to read the title. Oh, okay. Okay, yeah, the bill definitely. So Senate Bill 138. 138, yes. Rep, do I have to say Representative Labriola? Do I have to say Representative Labriola or no? No, no, it's okay, because it's just you now. But okay. um, usually it would, yeah. Senate Bill 183. Yes. Senate Bill 353. No. Senate Bill 753. No. Senate Bill 759. No. Senate Bill 761. No. Senate Bill 1016. No. House Bill 6573. No. The consent calendar includes items 1, 8, 9, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 18, and 19. Okay. Uh, that's what I thought was on the consent calendar, and I'm a yes. Okay. Okay, you're all set, Representative. Thanks a lot. Take care. Thank you. Have a good day. You too. Bye-bye. Thank you.